Yes. It's always a thing for me. <laughs> Good morning. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Kimberly Macquarie, and I'm the director of programming and the co-director of the Innovation Labs here at the Delhi Museum. And I'm uh, thankful to have you here this morning, and also thankful that I'm not the guest speaker this morning. Uh, yeah, doing a lot, doing a lot recently. Um, and especially excited because today we're going to be joined by um, a very special speaker, um, Leslie Alsasser from USF. And she's going to be talking about a topic that is um, really very dear to my heart, and that is the intersection between um, arts and medicine, and arts and wellness, and specifically um, how that's related to um, veterans. So I think it's going to be a really interesting talk, and we're all going to learn a lot. Of course, um, before we get started, um, I'd love to thank the City of St. Pete for the continued support of this and other programs. And then, of course, as always, um, thanking our members, because you are what make programs like this possible, but we wouldn't exist as an institution and wouldn't be fulfilling our mission without you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite you, of course, as usual, to please visit our website at thedeli.org. We have a lot of exciting programs. Um, and of course, as the director of programs, what am I going to say? Um, but it's absolutely true. Um, we're going to have some amazing things. So in conjunction with our Dolly's Drawing exhibit, we're going to have a drawing workshop um, on Tuesday the 12th. That's going to be super exciting. Um, back from its summer hiatus um, on the 13th, we're going to have art and meditation. Um, if you've never been to Art and Meditation, um, I highly suggest that you stop by. It's an hour well spent. Um, I always feel re-energized and recharged um, after that session. Um, also back after its summer hiatus is Poetry at the Dali, um, which is going to be taking place on the 14th. And we're going to have a special guest host. Um, Helen Pruitt-Wallace won't be with us for um, the first edition, but we will be joined by um, the City of St. Pete Poet Laureate, Gloria Munoz. So that'll be super exciting. And um, then, although I'm not the guest speaker today, I will be hosting on Saturday, um, the 16th, um, through the Innovation Labs, an Introduction to Creative Thinking workshop. So if your interest was piqued um, by my talk last month um, on Dali and creativity, um, be sure to join me then. Sunday, the 17th, we have our yoga at the Dali, and then our children's programming, Storytime and Dilly Dally. And if you missed it the first time around, it was so popular, it sold out. We have now um, launched a second um, entry for an evening of art and food with Chef Chuck Bandel. And so each of the bites that Chuck is preparing that evening are paired um, with a watercolor um, that he created of the star ingredient. So yeah, you, there's, no, there's no end to the well that is Chuck's talent. Um, so it's going to be an amazing night. And then on Thursday the 21st, we're going to have, um, it's like a combination between a lecture and a panel. Um, it's going to be a pretty interesting discussion on drawing, and specifically on the art of drawing and all of its aspects. So we're going to have, of course, our own Peter Tush, and we're also going to have Margaret Miller and Joe Fig, and they're going to be talking about drawing from um, different views, from the point of view of Dali, from the point of view of drawing as a step in the process towards different kinds of art, and then also drawing as part of the practice of the artist. Um, so it should be really interesting. And then there will be um, occasion for the audience to ask questions and join in the discussion. So super excited about that. And there's so much it doesn't fit on one page. Um, Finishing out September, um, we are also starting a new program. Uh, so are there any people in here who are Spanish speakers of any level? Beginning, you like my name is, you know the colors. Yeah, maybe intermediate. Um, it, it honestly doesn't matter what your level is. We're going to um, have a new quarterly series um, called Surreal Conversations. And they're going to be hosted um, in um, different languages. But we're going to be starting out with Spanish um, in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month. So Surreal Conversations in Español. And I will be um, leading the first one, and I'm super excited about it. So we're going to be discussing art um, and practicing our Spanish at the same time. So be sure to check it out. 
And then rounding out um, the month, another fun event um, in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month, we're going to be uh, hosting some wonderful scholars who wrote a book about the Cuban sandwich. Um, and it's called The Cuban Sandwich, A History in Layers. Um, and it will be a lecture on the Cuban sandwich, but also um, our own chef Chuck will be creating some Cubans um, that we're going to be able to um, snack on um, as we're listening to the lecture. So it should be all kinds of fun. And then um, be sure to join us for our next Coffee with Curator in October, um, where my wonderful colleague, Peter Tosh, will be presenting on Leonora Carrington, writer, painter, visionary. For those of you who haven't heard yet, um, in the Raymond James room next door, we're going to be installing um, an exhibition on Leonora Carrington, much like the ones that we've done in past years on Paul Eluard and Aimé Césaire, um, celebrating surrealists who really straddle um, some of these disciplinary boundaries. And of course, Carrington was not only um, an amazing uh, visual artist, but she's also an incredible writer. So it'll be a wonderful um, opportunity to explore her talents more. Now, my real job today um, is to introduce our amazing guest speaker. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Leslie Alsasser, who is the curator of education and an educator at the USF Contemporary Art Museum. She was the recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship to India in 2003 and was an artist in residence at Sanskriti in 2003 and 2005 and UCross in 2012. Elsasser holds a BA in Art and Design from Rhode Island School of Design, an MA in Fine Art from the University of South Florida, and has 20 years of pedagogical experience in the arts. She's currently the Breaking Barriers Program Director, and that's what we're going to learn a little bit more about right now. So please join me in welcoming Leslie. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Kim, and thank you everyone for coming. I'm going to be in good company. I know these people are coming to talk to you. Kim, is Barbara Cruz the one coming for the Cuban sandwich? She's one of them, absolutely. She's one of them. Yeah, as an Andy from the library. Okay, these are both my colleagues on another program. I was so excited to see that. And Margaret Miller, who's coming for the drawing, is actually my boss. So you'll be in great company. Um, as, she, as was introduced. My name is Leslie Elsasser, and I am the curator of education at USF Contemporary Art Museum on the Tampa campus. But before I even start, I want to give myself a little street cred so you kind of have context. What do I do? What does the curator of education do? Well, I don't design exhibitions, but I work very closely with the team in collections and our curators of exhibitions to design all the educational programs around the exhibition. I also design programs. I'm a team of one. So I run a full department, and if you see black circles under my eyes, you know why, because I'm working all the time. But I want to talk to you about a very special program, which I have come to absolutely love and understand more about every year. And that's a program called Breaking Barriers. So Breaking Barriers, I'll tell you what it is in just a moment, it is, a, it is a wellness program and an art program for our veteran community. But it started in 2017 as a pilot program. Why? We had a program then called Art and Health where we use the arts and medicine. So we collaborated with the nursing department, the College of Public Health, the medical humanities to work with a program called, or a strategy called Visual Thinking Strategies and VTS. And to work with all the creative aspects of the notion of creativity, of close looking, and we'll talk a little more about unpacking that and what that looks like, to, to obtain certain skills and to learn to, to conceptually think, to critically think, to reflect, and to enhance some of our natural senses. Well, in 2017, and by the way, I'm just going to preface it by saying almost all the images I'm going to show you are out of the workshops from the veterans this summer. So I'm, I'm not going to name them all because you're going to see a lot, but I just want to let you know that most of the images come from there. So in 2017, UF and Shands Hospital wrote to us, because they have a really robust art and health program. And they said, would you like to be one of three of a consortium 
of museums to develop pilot programs for veterans. So the other two, we were in good company, were Lowe and um, the Harn up at UF. And we said, yeah, we would love to. And we decided to go to certain workshops and lead certain workshops and roundtable discussions with veterans on campus and in the community to see where the gaps were, what we needed to do. And so we wrote a program that became part of this compendium for Florida museums on programs that are possible with the Loa and the Harn for their veteran communities. We're the only one that continued to grow and we grow every year and we expand every year. We're trying not to get too big for our britches because we are a very small team, but that's what I'm gonna share with you is the Breaking Barriers program. So we developed that as an extension. We had really three primary goals, and those goals were to offer experiential programming to veterans and their families. And it was all through photographic or the lens-based media. When we started, we started in the studio. Is 2018 was our first one. That was pre-COVID. Our second goal was to learn communication techniques and a language, both visual and verbal, and to gain thinking abilities, cognitive and critical thinking abilities. And we'll talk a little bit about why and gain some new tangible transferable skills. And our third part was to give access to the arts, but also to create a access between the civilian community and the veteran community. And we were hoping in turn that this would have therapeutic benefits and also be able to create lasting effects and change the culture and the misconceptions sometimes of the veteran from the silent veteran into a storyteller, into, into a narrator, and to share their stories in a broader way. This is one of the things we found when we did the roundtable discussions, that veterans felt, and, and I'm not saying all veterans, I'm just using this as a category right now, but they felt isolated, that they couldn't even share stories of deployment with their family. Mothers who had been deployed felt guilty leaving their kids in charge with their family, their significant others, their extended family. And these were things that were very hard to communicate and especially to communicate to a civilian population. So who do we serve? Well, Hillsborough County has 1,000, about 1, 500 residents. And out of that, about 98,000 of those are veterans, not including the families. USF has about 50,000 students, and out of that, 7,000 of those students are student veterans. So there was a huge population that we looked at that we could actually serve. So why did we decide to do this? Well, as an academic museum on a large campus, Part of our mission is to bring contemporary or completely contemporary art museum, to bring contemporary arts to the public, the public being the public at large, the public also being the public on campus, which are our constituents. And as an academic museum, our primary mission is as a teaching and research museum. So we thought we could give access to the power of the arts just so happens that Hillsborough County has the highest demographic of veteran population in the state of Florida. Florida and Arizona have the two highest demographics of veteran population in their state. We're home to McDill Air Force Base and Central Command for secret forces, et cetera. And that was a huge demographic that we really, in the arts, I have to be honest, really never considered. But it's a tremendous amount of our public that we give access to the power of art. USF was ranked number one of universities for their veteran population. So our community on campus was vast in terms of the veteran population. And many of these veterans have returned from multiple deployments and they're returning to integrate into a civilian population. But that civilian population has greatly changed in the last decade or in the last 20 years. Others came back with injuries some visible, many not, TBIs, traumatic brain injuries, um, PTS, PTSD, and they really needed a set of skills that were transferable to reintegrate and to heal. 
And we have a fabulous veterans hospital. It's called the James A. Haley Veterans Hospital. But they only have two creative therapists on their staff. And so the need to come back and learn skills, to have art-related, maybe therapeutic benefits, and to do this locally, we found that there was a huge gap in the population that encompasses our population in Hillsborough County and on the USF campuses. So the program we decided, and I want to preface this by saying something. We are not therapists. We are not considering ourselves therapists. We learned about the therapeutic benefits through our assessments, which I'll tell you about later. But we have four parts to our program. The first part is now six-week workshops, photographic workshops, where they are led by artists. And I can't, it's very weird for me to stand still, so I'm sorry, I feel very hyper. Um, <laughs> I'm not used to it, I'm a professor, I move. <laughs> so we do photographic workshops. Now this was all really terrific. We did video, all lens-based, mostly photography with DSLR cameras until COVID happened. And then what? What were we going to do? We had just started the program, phenomenal feedback. What were we going to do? We also noticed, the second part of that problem was that a lot of our veterans were homebound. They had limitations because of physical disabilities, limitations on their mobility. So what we started to do is to do everything through cell phone cameras. And this is really important because that camera you all have in your purse or your pocket is more powerful than the computers that we had 15 years ago and everybody has one. It's completely democratic. And we thought, well, we're not going to change the nature of the program. It is going to be, and here's the most important point, artist-led. Why? And it's not popsicle sticks and glitter. People are not do, coming and doing like, I feel blue today, therefore I'm going to make a blue photograph. They are learning from true artists in the field, pedagogues who actually do this, who have learned to think critically, who have learned to put process, which is a cognitive kind of thinking, into work, and to hire artists that have also worked or are sensitive to veterans. So last year, I'm very proud to say, we started a beginning, because of our assessment, a beginning and an advanced workshop. And veterans learn a new language, which is a visual language for veterans by the third workshop, you could see people foaming at the mouth. Because to launch into the world of the unknown is really going to take a lot of trust from people who have based their career on facts. So this idea to expand the thinking to multidimensional thinking and then process-based thinking really takes a good artist who is tried and true has been down the road. So that's the first part. The second part is a VTS, Visual Thinking Strategies. It's a session at the museum. It includes a small writing workshop. So the session's designed to increase vocabulary around the artwork. We use artwork selected from the workshops. In fact, we're doing our two workshops in October from the, for the museum session from the workshops we had in the summer. But we also do a private tour of the exhibition to start to put language behind experience, behind observations, to use close looking as a way to idealize, as a way to start a conceptual practice based on evidence of a primary source, which is actually the artwork. The third part is an exhibition at the Contemporary Art Museum. Why do we do this? We try and build a bridge between, and it's open to the public, it's free, build a bridge between the civilian population and the veteran population. We hope to smash preconceived ideas on both sides of the coin. What we have learned is veterans come in thinking artists are a little loosey-goosey, a little fray around the edges, where it's actually a discipline. It's, it has a philosophic structure, right? And then the making structure, the experiential part. And then people in the arts often think of the veteran population or the military machine as this one idea, but forgetting that it's made up of individuals with rich experiences, 
families, homes, lives, thoughts, and personal experiences. So we do that. And then I started a couple years ago, and this is live in a museum, doing an artist panel with anybody who would like to volunteer from the group. And this has really been a challenge for veterans because you are very vulnerable. I do give them the questions I'm going to ask the night before, but not before that. Why do we do this? Because the arts are smart. You're all here. You know that. The arts do foster ideas. Sometimes the veterans don't even know the level at which they're working at. So to present them in the best delights, in a dignified setting, and to hear their voice is extremely powerful. And then the show travels to the VA. This year it'll go from January to May, and we'll have our exhibition in May. I think it's the 14th. The fourth part is a full color catalog, an exhibition catalog, with narratives by each of the participants about one of their works. That's why we do the writing workshop, so that they start to learn how to craft the ideas that they've done through the visual language into a storyteller. So they have different modes of expression, and they also have the entries by the curators and by the artists themselves, and of course our director, which is Margaret Miller. So those are the four parts of the program. And I wrote this all down, so if anybody wants to take a screenshot, you certainly can. I am totally all right with that. So within that, we had some loose wellness goals. Our first wellness goal was to con contribute to the research in this line of work. And I'm going to say that this came out of, as I mentioned, our arts and health, which really went on a hiatus during COVID and is currently on a hiatus. But I worked quite a lot with um, Sarasota Memorial, the doctors and nurses there, on these wellness modalities and realized there was some research about the creative process in medicine, but we hope to contribute to that also. And to add to that pool, because it's not very large, our second was to teach those new intangible transferable skills. It could be anything from camera operations to how to light, to how to think about something, think with a workflow sequentially, abstractly. Um, and they do learn editing on the phone. So this camera, this powerful camera, is a camera that's always with people. So that they have that technology at their fingertips and they could take that into multiple professions. We also like to develop aesthetic development, foster aesthetic development to increase visual literacy. And as you all know, we live in an increasingly visual world. So for us to be able to discern the world around us visually is so important and to enhance those cognitive and critical thinking patterns and thinking abilities. We also wanted to make the link between visual and verbal and written communication to give different modes of skills to practice and provide a safe space. This was really important as a wellness modality. We learned during our roundtable discussions with veterans that they really wanted a safe space. As they said, and I quote, veterans like to talk to veterans. It's not a safe place when you come back from multiple deployments, when you've missed 10 years of civilian life. And this was so important for us to create. And I can tell you, if you ask later, the multiple ways we create that safe space. And the last part was give visibility to those narratives to start the healing process. And it's not only visibility to each other and to the museum world, it's also visibility to the civilian world and the veterans themselves. How many of you have made artwork in your life? Lots of you. How many of you have shown in a gallery your artwork or what have you? Anybody? It is so weird when you walk in and see your work, right? And you go like, oh, I didn't know I did that. I did that. Oh my gosh, I hope they don't see what I was really thinking because I really didn't self-reflect in all those aspects. We hope the veterans can have that experience, but also overhear the casual conversations to learn more introspectively about themselves towards the healing process. And I want to say, not every veteran is a broken individual, but we can all grow, right? So even the healthy of us, healthiest of us, can learn something. I think you should all go to the drawing workshop, by the way. Just saying. So... 
Within those four parts, we have wellness goals. In the studios, we hope to develop positive strategies to engaging the unknown. That's a scary place in the best of days, right? And have some cultural competence, empathy, self-awareness. These traits are also value, highly valued by medical practitioners. The VTS session in the museum, how many of you have participated in a visual thinking strategy session? Anybody? A couple. All right. Oh, try and find one. You're in for a treat. It's really viewer-centered, where you express your ideas through your personal experience. Collectively, you come to some ideas, and this is why we do it, to foster close looking, collaborative meaning-making, meaning-making, build some empathy, and solve problems that are difficult to put into words based on primary evidence, which is what you're looking at. Through that process of visual storytelling, when it comes together, we have the exhibition so that the narrative becomes larger than one single person. So that there's access between the civilian world, the academic world, the art world, and the veteran world. And by doing that, we hope in a broad invisibility, both for the veterans, but also for the community. That is who we serve. And then we do the full color exhibition catalog. This is a magical place. This gives a broad reach. We print them, they're free. We print about 200, and then we do them at cost on demand. We also offer the PDFs entirely free to anybody who'd like one. And I probably should have brought some, but I, I, I didn't even think of it. But if you'd like to go to our website, if you'd like to see them, they're free to you in a PDF form. We do this for people who have limited mobility, for people who do research. It's part of our goal in the wellness model to contribute to that research and give documentation to each artist of what they're doing for to live through posterity. Whoops. So I just want to say, we don't make this stuff up, just saying. I'm not so bold to say I'm a therapist or I came up in the medical world. I did not. I came up, I'm a fine artist. I was a painter and sound uh, installations. I did my MFA. I did an MA in art history. When I got back, because I studied non-Western art, I was in India for a number of years. And everything we do as an artist and as an art historian, is evidence-based. So, so is this program. So some of it comes out of the creative art therapy. It's called CAT. There's not a ton of research. I'm going to lay out some for you guys if you are interested in this. But we share similar methods, objectives, outcomes. But I can't emphasize enough, and I want to kind of move on this. We are not therapists. We don't have a therapeutic degree. That is not what we do. We may offer certain modalities that have therapeutic effects, but we work closely with the creative therapist at the VA, James A. Haley. Her name is Marilee Jorn. She's my partner in crime for moving the exhibition across, but also coaching. And I did, I did a quite a bit of learning, and I have had quite a a bit of instruction about these different occurrences because people do have trigger points, but we are not the therapists. We offer a program with therapeutic wellness benefits. So I want to quote Donna Betts. She worked with Creative Forces and she published quite a few interesting white papers. And for us, we apply it like this, but I am going to read the quote because I don't want to misquote her. We say in photography workshops, our per participants learn photography skills while also developing a visual language. And this is what Donna Betts has to say about this. She says, art making, quote, teaches the language of expression that channels and stabilizes behavior and emotions, such as grief, survivor's guilt, anger, and anxiety. I'm going to say that again. Art making teaches the language of expression that channels and stabilizes behavior. This is what art does. We're not making it up. Art does this naturally 
through the process of making and self-reflection. So we are following on these models and building our program based on these models of creativity, of making, of self-reflection, review, verbalization, articulation, etc. As recently as 2020, there was support published, and I'm going to show you these sources in a minute, for the use of creative arts in the improvement of TBIs and PTSD. TBIs are traumatic brain injuries. They can happen in multiple ways. It can happen from gases. It can happen from projectiles. It can happen from artillery. They can happen from loud sounds, losing, you know, certain functions in the brain. Um, and PTSD is, we all know what PTSD, and there's also PTS. Not everybody's depressed. But as recently as 2020, and the VA works with this, supports the use of the creative arts, which are the CAP programs, in the amelioration of TBIs and PTSD. So we really work with these models, but we don't measure those particular outcomes. There was another study done between the creative art therapies and VTS that have a wide range of therapeutic benefits and outcomes when used together to improve progress and speed treatments um, in preparedness. So we do use those together, although we are not therapists. Evidence also suggests that providing veterans with the opportunity to express themselves and share their stories can help with the most common symptoms of PTS, PTSD, and just depression. How many of you are veterans? Are there, is there anybody here? Yeah, a couple. OK. So people, some people are deployed. Some people did service here. And thank you to the veterans here for your service. Some people don't come back with physical ailments or necessarily PTSD or TBS. Some people have depression feel lost. There's just a benefit of community, which we have seen in a lot of studies um, about aging and just about longevity that involve community. And we work towards all these different nodes at the same time with a deceptively simple program. So also engaging with narratives and myth-busting that assumption is stereotypes learning language, representation of, in and of itself. All of these things allow a communication and for veterans to communicate effectively and find words not only to describe artwork, but to describe life, to describe family life. There was a woman named Janelle several years ago, and she was extraordinary. And if you go on our website, you'll see some of her photographs. But Janelle had a survivor's guilt for a team she managed um, in the Middle East. And she also had mom guilt. Has anybody ever experienced mom guilt? Yeah. Okay. A lot of you, right? I'm a mom to a four-legged. But I put him in daycare for like days like today. And I'm like, oh, is he going to be okay? I have to look at Facebook later, see if his picture's on there, right? But she freaked out on the second week of breaking barriers. I don't know what to photograph. It all seems so meaningless until she started photographing the messiness of her home, her home life, because she couldn't keep it together. She couldn't keep together her three kids, her husband being deployed. She had just come back. And she made the most extraordinary photographs of her, her dog tags, her kids nursing, just the little detrius of her nightstand and the amount of medication between her and her husband and her kids. And these, were, these, were, these weren't even veteran photographs. I mean, these were just life photographs. But when people start to unravel where the anxiety might come from, the un unmanageability, or the successes, and I'm going to show you a photograph, I think it's next on here. It becomes an extraordinarily powerful story when you see that all together. And the, at the end of that six week journey with other veterans, even in the virtual platform. Okay, be real folks. By the time we started going back out, 
how many of you wanted to do one more thing versus Zoom? Oh, right? When I see a Zoom invitation for a meeting come through, I'm just like, oh, this can't be happening, right? I think we all have PTSD from Zoom. Like somebody says that, you go like, oh, right? Well, this platform we use is Zoom because we have people we realized who can't go out. We also have a limited budget. I mean, that's a real thing, right? We just found out yesterday we scored the highest on one of the grants we wrote. Hopefully, that means we'll get the grant. Um, so we can grow the program and go back to doing one studio in the College of the Arts, who we collaborate with, if indeed this happens, and still offering the cell phone photography because this has proved invaluable for people who can't get out in terms of making art, but in terms of community as well. So think about this. We can't even do a meeting on Zoom. Try doing a video class through Zoom. Yikes, right? So we do measure outcomes. And I, I think this is important to tell you. We measure outcomes. Um, we use, we don't do it actually. We have outside sources. So we've partnered with researchers at the VA before. And we didn't do that for the last few years because what we found is once we hooked up with the VA asking questions, which we never thought of, the veterans were dubious. Like, where is this information going? Even though we promised we wouldn't share it, we don't share email addresses, we, we don't share last names. If people don't want to have their cameras on, they don't have to. We make sure there are no names below the captions on Zoom. We go through a lot of protocols, and anybody working on the program is highly trained for this. Anybody working on the program, I have one assistant and sometimes somebody else. So basically, it's short training. But we use a combination of qualitative and quantitative. Lately, we've been partnering with the Communications College at USF, and there is within there a bubble and of folks that work with veterans, and that's what their communication studies have been. And they've been doing our assessments. So they rate anything from the success of our goals to the success of the implementation, to the instructors, to the projects, to a whole litany of things, to the experience, accessibility, um, levels of availability. Because I do want to tell you something. During those six weeks in the summer, Everybody thinks, I have summers off. Wrong. During those six weeks, it's 24-7 for me because you do get a lot of questions. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of little wrinkles to iron out. But I'm just going to read a couple. And of course, I chose these. But this is a basic tenor of the kind of things, of feedback we get, which helps us build the program. So one of these... The first one's from 2021, the second one's 2022. I valued learning on a creative level with my veteran brothers and sisters. It's a therapy that has an outcome. I wish I could box and sell. Um, I parrot that. I wish I could box and sell that retirement plan. But we don't. This is a free program, 100% free. And we believe in paying our artists. The rest of us work on pro bono. But... Our artists we pay well because it is really them leading the veterans through, and the program is offered free. If we do studio programs, the equipment is also, we try and have enough equipment on loan for people who don't have DSLR cameras or video on the DSLRs. And we provide the um, editing software as well. The second was from last year, and we just got this in. They said, I think... It was a very good workshop in the sense that I learned a new technical skill and learned a little bit about myself. Who could ask for more, right? And I actually learned a lot from other participants in the class. That is our goal. So I want to show you all, before we just talk about it, um, a couple things. I found this quote when I was working with Sarasota Memorial, and I use this in my medical humanities class, which I'll be teaching tomorrow, three sections of tomorrow. And it says, in the worlds of both art and medicine, individuals imagine experiences beyond their own, own and test hypotheses. Uh, 
By integrating their own prior knowledge and intuition, don't ever underestimate your intuition. And by comparing their evidence with that of others. There is a direct link between medicine and art at the very core of the process. And we believe that these transferable, tangible, and psychological skills improve all aspects of life. Not just wellness, but well-being for a human being to be in the world and to be well. And these transferable skills are applicable to a lot of professional, peer-to-peer, rehabilitative, and academic settings. This is why we do it every year, and we keep it going. So some of these skills are used in professions, including diverse medical practices, and they're available in veteran health care. Not everybody's able to go into the VA. Not everybody is enrolled in a VA. But for us, and this is really coming from me, I believe museums can use the very nature of creativity and creating, and that act, to offer our communities, whether in St. Pete, whether in Tampa, whether in Hillsborough and Pinellas County, wellness benefits. And I think that is one of the greatest strengths of the art world and the museum world, is we have the abilities to do that and share that with our communities. And if you'd like a screenshot, I just wrote, I'm not going through every one of these, do not worry. I just wrote these down if you wanted a screenshot of some recent articles that have come out in diverse and sundry but important different publications. So different art-related therapies, creative cat therapies, but also ones in the medical field. And some of these are through the medical humanities. Some of these are in creative forces. Some of these are in the Journal of Museum Education. And we have yet to publish something, which I deeply regret, but it's a question of doing versus time and really running the programs, being an integral part of developing the programs and working with the people in the programs is really very, very important to me. So on that note, I want to thank you for coming today. And I want to invite you to ask any questions that you might have. Thank you. What questions do you have? Yeah. Okay, this was an excellent question. Do I find, or we find people who enroll, do they have any art background, none, start at ground zero? I would say the only art background they had is when we have, and we often have repeat customers, people from the previous workshops, but absolutely zero, which is why, per feedback from one of the assessments, we started a beginning and advanced workshop. Because now we have some people in their fourth and fifth year who have taken it every year who really want to dig deeper into conceptual issues. So they have some of the tangible skills now, and they want to develop some of the thinking abilities in a deeper, more profound way. So no, we rarely, apart from that, have ever had anybody with any art background. So it's starting from ground zero, learning the language. Oh, what is a picture plane? What is foreground, middle ground, background? What are hues? I mean, very new, learning the language of art through verbal communication and also visual communication. So that's a great question. Who else? So, mics over here we can pass around also. If you don't mind, I'm going to come out here and bring my mic with me because I can't see you from here. Yes. Thank you and great job. Uh, one question. So I have some friends who are veterans who I think this would be kind of a stretch. You know, if, if I were explaining it to them. So if you were giving them the elevator pitch, what would it be? Good question. What did I write on the website? <laughs> um, we just call it a photography workshop in three parts, I believe. To, to have camaraderie, to 
have a visual language and express themselves in a new medium. I think I would say something like that. And now you make me think, oh, I wish I brought her old invitations to give your friends. But I understand that's a stretch because it's a stretch for a lot of veterans, a lot. And one of our collaborators on campus for promotion only is veteran success because they speak that language to veterans that go like, oh my God, popsicle sticks and glitter. Like, <laughs> yeah, hell no, right? And then, you know, they'll talk to us and they're just, I could just see it in their thought bubble, like eye roll. But, but we speak like the same intelligent language, right? And so do you want to learn to use your cell phone? And some people we ask sincerely, why did you come? I want to learn to take better selfies. I want to take better pictures of my grandkids. And this year was portraiture. Whatever that means, now expand your boundaries. But that's why people came. What they left with was things like a classical portrait like that. This was a family of a veteran, had never done anything before, or something like this. This was all from the same class, or that. So, and that's Augie. He's been with us for five years. He's an amazing guy. He, you might have seen us on the news, Channel 10 last year is with Augie. But I would say, you know, look at the website. Ha! <laughs> Not avoiding the question. I just really don't remember what I wrote. Yeah, you're welcome. Who else? Yes. That's a great question. Do we offer them at VA hospitals? Do they come to the museum? So, as I said, we're not therapists. No, we don't offer them through the VA. Now, Marilee Jorn, the creative therapist, has proposed collaboration, but it's difficult. We're part of a university, right? So, and I'm going to be completely frank about this. Where does the money come from then? If it's a partnership. And we don't want to charge veterans. So it gets to be a little sticky. So they don't come to the museum. If we do live ones, we partner with the College of Art and Art History at USF, and we will use the studio there and their computers. But this is part of the beauty of being virtual. People never have to leave their homes. So, you know, it's. As much as we would love to partner in that way with the VA, we keep running into stalemates. But what we do do with the VA, which will be first time next year, is we are offering them um, all of their veterans who, who are part of the creative arts program over there, we're offering them entry, like priority entry, and they'll have a week to do that before it goes live anywhere else. So we do try and work with them. And Marilee Jorn, she's a superstar. So yeah, it, it's, it's tricky. It's not impossible, but we're not there yet. Yeah. Hold on one second. There's one in the back that's going, and then I've got you. Hi. Yeah. I was Hi. just wondering, do you have examples of the exhibit catalog here, or can we get it? <sighs> You're talking to a person who has hurricane brain. I come unglued. I should have had all this done. Yesterday's my first day back. No, but I'm going to, before we leave, I'll walk you through the website where you could find it. And I'll show you where you could have the digital version. I don't have any left from last year, but from a couple of years ago, I do. Yes, sir. That is an excellent question. Do we have anybody that's not acceptable into the program? You know, this, this could occur, and yes, we have. Um, why, the reasons people might not be acceptable, they might, they might not be stable enough, they might induce harm to themselves or other people, if we suspect that, our application program is really easy, but that has happened twice. And then we talk to the therapist over at the VA, and we ask if they should go for an evaluation. Um, one person was very, very, very sick. 
physically very sick. And we didn't think it was fair to have them drive because they would endanger them or other people. Other people that people would accept in a program, for instance, there was a guy who was phenomenal, turned out, but he, he had trouble navigating. So we would drop a pin every week for the same place, be on the phone, walking them through directions. So we have to evaluate a little bit through our training. But as I said, we're not therapists. So if people need therapy, it's probably not the best program. If they need therapeutic benefits, it's good. But that's a very good question. And it's kind of an area we're looking more at right now. Yeah. Yeah. No, but that's who I did my workshops training with. Um, the, the Creative Forces came out of Walter Reed. And when we were invited to do this in 2017, the Stras Performing Arts Center hosted a three-day conference. And we attended that. And then we were invited to give a workshop on our program at UT with other museum professionals, creators, et cetera. And so we had some feedback on that. And this is before we did the round tables, et cetera, just to start ideation and that kind of thing. But yeah, that's exactly right. We probably should. But as I say, it's a question of department of one. So there's, you know, my dog wants to be walked sometimes. But no, you're exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. First of all, I want to swoon. Thank you very much for that suggestion. Um, second, so how do we promote this? So we do have a media team. And they promote it through their channels, also through Channel 10. They're a big supporter of us, veteran success in the VA. We could do a better job, for absolute sure. Somewhat. And I did have somebody I worked with at McDill who has moved on. So I don't know about any of you, just on a good day, penetrating McDill Air Force Base it's kind of like walking through the Great Wall of China. Um, but when you have a veterans program, they're like, oh, who are you? So there's that. Um, we are grant funded, very small. You would not believe. I mean, we work on a shoestring. If we had operating budget and to grow, how many people pass through? It's only summers. We have to cap our classes each workshop at 30. So. Ultimately, only 60 people could pass through, but they don't usually all stay. Why? Because people have lives. These are adults. It has to be 18 and over, I should say, because we try not to edit the content, but be respectful. So um, people have lives. Kids get sick. You know, things happen. People have injuries. They have treatment plans. So we usually finish about 40 in the summer. So about 40 people a year pass through. What would it take to really grow this program? I would have to think. I mean, the I just finished writing a behemoth of a grant. I kid you not, it was bigger than writing the Fulbright grant, which was 40 pages. Um, we'll see what happens. But what we'd like to do is have additional instructors and then a bigger team to administer the program. Unlimited resources? I don't know. That would be super great. Would I, my dream, my ultimate dream, but this is not, this is a Leslie dream. This is not sanctioned by the museum, is that we could, I'm going to say this word because it's the only word that comes to mind right now. It's, it's a commerce word, but package the program so other institutions could run it with their communities. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that would be my dream. So for instance, the Dali, we could say, these are the things we do. These are the things that are important. These are some of the sources. 
who are your artists, who's your community, and really let different communities build their programs, but in a really rich, meaningful way for the community. That's what I'd love to do. Yeah, of course. Do you want to see where the website is before I forget? OK, I don't know what's going to be on my, I think I have some funny things on my, um, not, not icky, but <laughs> probably dog things on my. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll do this quickly, because I don't want to take all your precious time, but could somebody just tell me where the internet is on this machine? <laughs> That's the office? I don't find it. The blue green up. Uh, OK. You can tell I don't use PCs, right? So you would go to US 